Welcome everybody to the Gameology Podcast. This episode is all about session length. What does that mean? That means how long are you going to sit down and play a game? What does that entail? Now, Taylor, what made you think of this topic? So just uh, sort of coming off of our discussion about like overall game length last week, I just thought, um, you know, it ended up being a relatively shorter episode and it kind of naturally inspired the the like consumption length of how long is the podcast? How long is um, really anything that you consume? Like a, um, a YouTube video that's 10 minutes is probably easier to consume than a movie, which is like an hour and a half long experience. Um, even with modern players that remember where you left off, it's just simply easier to have a something that's been divided into chunks and that the length of the time has been separated and given to you. Sort of like reading chapters out of a book. You know, there's always that feeling of reading a a satisfying chapter length in a book rather than, you know, I think we've all had the experience where we're like reading a good book and we're like, okay, I'll just read to the end of this chapter. Oh my God. It's so much longer, so much longer than I would have had to, um, would have liked to set aside for just this. I'm going to have to stick my bookmark in a place that I didn't necessarily want to leave off at. But, um, the same kind of thing can happen when you're going to play a game as well is that there are, only certain ways that games can be divided up into different session lengths. Um, obviously, you have games that are broken up into levels where that session length is very naturally dictated. Um, you have like longer form experiences where you know you choose to save and quit at a given time, and you even have this like rising trend in a lot of Nintendo games where they start saying things like, "Hey, you've been playing the game for a while. Why don't you take a break?" To which a lot of gamers are like, "Don't tell me what to do." Yeah, well, I th- the stigma behind a lot of games is that they're addicting and you even have people talking about that as a positive um, mark about a game and people are reviewing it they're like oh it's got a really addicting loot system like that's a fantastic thing and it's I feel like my my play session time is is usually changed only um, to be made longer whereas uh, like say I'm like okay I need to well, shorter or longer, if, if you just need to get off, like if I, if I know that I need to finish, you know, get ready for work or something and I can, I can sense, I don't want to go any further in this section. Otherwise there's going to be like a big cut scene and there's going to be something mm-hmm. that I'm not really ready to hop out into. So it's, um, I mean, could we just get around that with having like ultra, you know, like you said, with modern players on YouTube, could that let remember ex- exactly where you were? Would you want to jump back into a game halfway through a cut scene or a climactic moment? I mean, it's you. You wouldn't want to necessarily, but I think just like the the demands of modern life, <laughs> it's just it's very nice to have that as an option. Um, I remember, like, you know, if I'm if I'm playing um, when I was playing through the world ends with you, um, I got to like the end of that game, and it was like the final cutscene, the last boss, and I was at the cottage with my grandparents, and I was much younger at the time, and they're like come on, we got to leave. We're going to head back. And I'm like, it's the last cut scene. I can't pause it. They're like, turn it off. It's like, ah, it, my save point was so long ago. And, um, yeah, it's a, if, you know, with the, with the, the DS, I at least had the option of just like closing the lid and putting it in sleep mode. Um, and with a lot of modern games, even if you can't interrupt a cut scene, you can, um, hit like the home button or something and it'll suspend the gameplay. Um, which is useful for like pausing the game in a way that you otherwise couldn't. Um, like you know, the 3DS can suspend gameplay. The PlayStation can suspend gameplay. Like all every like modern console that I'm thinking of has some means of like suspending gameplay. Yeah, usually I, I they do on, other tasks. I my Vita, uh, like uh, obsolete at all times, and sometimes I won't jump in and, and play a different game on my Vita because I know I have one that's um, in a suspended state. Yeah, so it's just it's very useful to be like at any point be able to put the experience down. You know, you can. You can um, always pause a video. You can always like put a bookmark in a book. You can always um, halt these things if something else demands your attention. You know, I, I think um, there's a. It would be frustrating if we didn't have this way of pausing an experience. You know, like it, <laughs> what if you need to hop up because like your oven timer has just gone off and you're you're playing in the like hour and a half long time that it takes for your lasagna to heat but it's done and it's done now and you better go grab it and you know in in that case it's something that can probably wouldn't hurt with a couple extra minutes but it you don't want to forget about it you don't want to be like i'm just gonna watch the end of the cutscene, and then it's like 10 minutes later your lasagna is burnt um 
so just giving giving people the option to suspend gameplay at any time and jump back into gameplay like I'm playing through Ocarina of Time on the Wii U with my little sister and the ability to um, basically use save states in the game to um, suspend the game at absolutely any single point to uh, and then to jump back into that um, without having to go past the like the opening title screens and the credit sequences and the file select and all that. It's really nice to be, you know, we don't have a lot of time to play, but we can just like plonk ourselves down and immediately launch right into the game, um, which is something that I tried to do when I created Zarnok Fortress, because, you know, uh, anytime that you have like your modern game with like 50 seconds of unskippable logos and it has to load the menu before you can even select your file and then it has to load the file and like, you know, three minutes later, you're certainly not looking at a quick, oh, I'll just jump in and play a little bit, you know? Yeah, actually, I want to jump in real quick because lately I found myself really craving like quick 20 minute experiences that mm -hmm. I can hop into and play immediately and that are just going to provide a simple sensation. Like I, if somebody out there knows of a great flying game that is on the PS4 or on the computer that I could hop in and do like flight simulator in 10 minutes and have a decent enough experience. Whereas, um, and what you mentioned about loading menus uh, I was, I've been a big fan of uh, NHL games for mm -hmm. a long time, but uh, a really, uh, an evolution of it that I don't like is that they want the UI, the interface of it, to look so cool and have all these like flashy stuff. But what it does is it slows everything down. When you need to cycle through the 26 possible teams, I want that to be instantaneous. Mm. I don't care that the logo is a beautiful 3D graphic. Yeah. That is useless. That's not actually affecting the gameplay. When you're just dealing with the nuts and bolts of the game, that's a way to like speed up the experience for people so that they can hop into it. It was one of the great things about um, Modern Warfare 2 and why I like the multiplayer of it was that I felt like from the time I turned on my PlayStation, I could get into a match within minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's just, it's it's good UI, UI design, bad UI design. You never want to wait on an animation to finish playing for you to be able to like pick an option or select something, especially if that's um, you know a menu you're navigating where you have to navigate often or an animation that takes just slightly too long that you can't skip. Um, all of those things are terrible. And it's why when I designed uh, Zarnok Fortress, there's no splash screens, no logos at the beginning of the game. Um, they're just on the left and right of the main menu. Another thing I cut out was the title screen. Because how many games do you boot up nowadays where it's a big AAA experience and you have like this screen that just says the name of the game yeah. and it says press start? <laughs> why yeah. do you need that? It just, you know, get, when, when, I, when Zarnok Fortress launches, you have the title of the game at the top, you got the logos on the side, and immediately... Your cursor is hovering over the continue button. You press that, and in one single click, you are instantly loaded back into the last file you played. You don't even have to go to file select. You don't have to do anything. It's just like, you know, you start the game, and in like less than a second, you are back to where you were. Well, you're, you're looking at decisions that people make based on the assumption you're only going to see it once. Mm. So let's make the title screen the greatest title screen in history. When I worked in radio, uh, there were some other people that would produce their own advertising spots, and they had this incorrect assumption that the 30-second ad they made for their own show had to be Sgt. Pepper's. It had to be the greatest 30 seconds of audio you'll ever experience. And it had, like, multiple vocal effects and, oh, like, and these long Definitely. intros. And they're not thinking about it in the context. In the context of a radio listener, they've heard a show they like, now they have to listen to ads. Ads, ads suck. Mm -hmm. Get them out of the way. But you're trying to give them good information. You don't want you don't want them to tune you out. So you just really uh, what might have sounded more boring would be no music. Give the information in ten seconds and you're done. And people would have liked that a little more. So it's there. Yeah, there. There. I find that with Uncharted too. When it starts up, I spend a long time looking at Drake just staring down. And there's actually not an indication of what is happening. Mm -hmm. You just assume, all right, this is loading. But could we have skipped that in some way? Could we have worked around it? So, yeah, they need to design it in the way that people are going to see this 50 times. They bought the game. That's the title screen. Yeah, I, I think that, um, I guess that it's sometimes when a game licenses technology, they're like under obligation to show the splash screen at the start every single time. But I just, I feel like it would be so much better for the user experience if, you know, rather than every time you turn on the game, you have to sit through five to 10 seconds of logos. If it just, you know, maybe you show that the first, second, you know, ideally just the first, right? Ideally, you only see those once and then forever thereafter, they are 
just superimposed on the menu screen like I did in Zarnok Fortress. Because um, I have my logo, and then I have Throwaway Games, the guys who I commissioned to do the artwork for the game. Um, you know, maybe these big companies want to have their game show, their logo show a couple more times. You know, it's on the box art. Like, do you really not know that Electronic Arts is the company behind Mass Effect at this point? Um, but, you know, I, I think that uh, after people work on something for a really long time, they want to get their name up in front of it. Um, I know that when companies invest a lot of money into the um, publishing of these games, they want to have their name like front and center. They want to have Adver- these advertising fancy graphics. Is, is so expensive that I'm assuming any chance you get to do it for free, they're going to take advantage of it. And who knows? I mean, what are the what are the subconscious effects of constantly seeing? How about the word um, havoc? You know, mm-hmm. I've, that's a word I've seen so many times, or frostbite, or yeah. like these different engines. But it's like, what does that mean to the average player? Almost nothing. What do they care what engine was made to use the game? Like that might appeal to me as a developer if I even used 3D game uh, software, but I don't. I use two-dimensional game software. So it doesn't, like, I, I agree that, um, like in the case of the publishers, getting their name in front of you is um, definitely, that's what they want. But that's still there if they were to put it on the menu screen, as I suggested, rather than always putting it in front of the players. M- making it a subject of ire, you know, mm. um, like I listen to other podcasts where they have ad reads that are like under 30 seconds and that's fine. But then there are certain podcasts I listen to where they go on for like a minute or two. And if every time I hear like the little musical cue that introduces the um, ad on the podcast, I just pull my phone out and hit the mash and uh, mash yeah. the like skip 30 seconds ahead until I hear the person stop talking. Cause it's just, yeah. Sometimes you can tell they've pre-recorded it too, even when they try to sneak them in. And mm-hmm. as soon as I hear that, I go for it. There's a bunch of podcasts I listen to where uh, the host will try to sneak in 15 minutes of intro bef- of talking about himself before he brings a guest on. And the reason I put the episode on is cause I like the guest and I got to like randomly find 22 minutes in when I hear that other person's voice and you're going to lose some content. And it's, I mean, that's an old trick to like save the best for last and try to lead people in, but we're getting so good at skipping around that and it can feel a little bit, uh, it's a negative connotation. On an unrelated note, we will be taking user questions and feedback at the end of the show. <laughs> Sponsored by, um, but yeah, no, it just, it's, it's all about, um, when you're considering uh, a player's session length, you want to decrease the amount of time it takes them to get into a session and you want to leave them with a quick and accessible way of concluding a session. Um, so oftentimes they complete a level, they have the option to like, you know, call it right there and then, or they have the option to like save and load the game, um, which very quickly can be exploited as save scumming. Are you familiar with the term? I love it. Okay. So just to, for those who don't know, save scumming is the term ascribed to like, I managed to get a hit on this boss. I'm going to save the game right here and now in the middle of this encounter. And oh no, I died. Let me reload the checkpoint I created for myself five seconds ago. Um, And it's a very easy way to artificially deflate the difficulty of an experience. And going back to the example of playing Ocarina of Time with my little sister, we use save states like that very frequently, but often because the... um, controls in ocarina of time for like just walking in a straight line can be kind of difficult sometimes believe it or not so we're up on a high ledge and it's very narrow we will create a safe state right there and then just to walk safely across that ledge because the amount of time it takes for us to climb back up is just time we don't want to spend so you can use save states and save scumming um to deflate the difficulty of the game but if you're concerned with that then you can take the mario game approach and just say that after you beat a level, um, you know, normally you're only afforded the option of uh, saving the game when you get to a fortress or a castle. But at any time in the game, you can save and quit to title. And that gives you the immediate out of like, okay, I didn't beat the castle, but I can conclude my play, se- my play session and safely turn off my game system without losing my progress. Actually, there's an, and a lot of times when you beat a Mario level, they allow you to press start and exit out of the level safely. So if you're that about too. to fall into a pit, you yeah, can well, uh, sneak they, out. Yeah, and exactly. Like, they don't let you do that the very first time you're playing through, but if you've, um, you know, if you, if you have played the game before, like Kirby is another example where they, like, let you exit the door, exit the level. The, the way it's actually phrased, the reason I said that is because it says, like, exit level through the door um, in one of the particular Kirby games. But it's, it's a... Uh, Definitely a great way to 
you know, avoid the pitfalls of save scumming while accommodating players and letting them um, create save points as they find necessary. But save save scumming in on a narrative standpoint. If you're having a game that has branching paths, sometimes mm-hmm. I'll use it because I want to know what the uh, what the other path would have been if I would have taken this option or would have responded this way. Right. So that's why it's important to offer both um, the option to like the traditional save and continue and save and quit um, wherever possible. Uh, if you are in a circumstance where you very deliberately don't want the player to like save scum their way through a single boss fight, then that's where you might only op- offer the save and quit option. But if you're, you know, in the moments before a uh, narrative conversation, then you allow the player the ability to like save and continue or create multiple save slots. Right. But, it's, you know, in terms of people that might not have enough time to get good enough at a game to to beat a certain boss or maybe the bosses are just unbalanced mm. or it's you know or they're just not skilled i mean I, i'm just i i can see where you're going yeah. and i'm just gonna say save scumming is not the solution uh there are it's it's like a last ditch effort that you can leave in your game as an option for people to like brute force their way through a boss encounter but it's it would be much better to find other ways of balancing the difficulty in your game right. than just allowing for people to save okay. their way through it. So you're saying like put the imp- the impetus on the on the developer to design a way that they can get around it. Like a good example, uh, Deus Ex, uh, Man- Human Revolution, uh, the last generation one, the bosses were so unbalanced from the rest of it. I put almost every single one of them on easy so I can get through them, but I still loved the game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just some other way of getting through the game rather than saves coming because it does it does work. Like undeniably, you can just keep on iterating on your own uh, successes and failures. Um, which uh, you know, I, here's a terrible segue, but just the, the fact that I mentioned iterating. Um, if you have like a, a game with a much like sor- shorter play session, like let's say we're talking about um, even just like within a single play session, you are trying. Um, to play like something um, on a mobile platform, like a mobile phone, um, you're playing something like, oh, let's use an example everyone knows, even if I don't like talking about it, Flappy Bird. And you're, you know, your bird crashes face first into a pipe and you plummet to your death. It takes an infuriating amount of time, only a couple seconds, but to restart the game from when you die, you have to wait for your bird to like crash. You have to wait for the buttons to appear on screen. Then you have to tap play and then you have to give it a couple clicks before the pipes even start appearing. You even have the opportunity to start incrementing your score. I find that even in that like tiny, tiny, um, you know, window, there is still an opportunity to improve iteration time. Um, for example, I created a game, um, called cliff. And this is about the like most simple uh, possible sort of game that you can imagine. We're going to do something a bit different. I'm going to hand this to you while we're on the podcast, and I want you to try out Cliff. So it's a... Why don't you describe what you see? All right, it's a vertical screen. It just says tap to jump. It has try, streak, and wins on it. I see it looks like two cliffs and a space in between them. So I'm going to press... Okay, so it just shoots... So the... It's on the title screen, is great. So it starts immediately. Yeah. And it's the second that you die, it just appears on the left. So that your character's scrolling to the right, and every time you fail, it just comes up. It's like a conveyor belt. Yeah. And that is the entire game. This game is in a conveyor belt. You either get a point for successfully doing it, or you don't. And that's great. It was Mario One did that. Uh, this is a nice game, by the way. Thank you, Cliff. <laughs> uh, Super Mario Brothers One. You press start. You picked one or two player game, and then immediately you're into yeah, it yeah right? the background was the game it was mm-hmm. really fantastic there's no cutscenes. the earlier zelda games too started off like that and then as zelda's evolved it's become more of a story uh i think i, I stopped playing either twilight prince yeah twilight princess i just didn't I, I couldn't get through the tutorial it was so boring to me that i i just i lost all engagement with it i remember when i first got twilight princess i couldn't figure out that you needed to use the fishing rod to catch a couple fish and have the fish land near the cat who was going to go grab it like i bought that game sounds I, like an old riddle i wet i waited in line i i was a uh, you know um got up super early in the morning got in line for a nintendo wii and got that game on launch and you can imagine my frustration when i get home and i can't progress i had to go buy a guide to the game because i couldn't figure out how to the stupid cat because this is of course in an era where online guides are not immediately available for something. I would have had to wait much longer for like IGN or someone to put up a guide for the game. Um, 
but yeah, just the, the reason I had you try a cliff there a moment ago is because it um, it's a, it's an example of something that I, I created the original concept for cliff um, a while back, and then when Flappy Bird became popular, I'm like, I'm sorry. And I published Cliff as an app on the App Store. And that's that's a, a game that you can try for free either on mobile or on my website. But it's, um, it's a game that I only spent a couple hours making. Um, and it just, despite the fact that it, it uh, took so little time to make, I think it still emphasizes a lot of the, the key points I'm talking about in terms of like iteration time. And um, it's the ideal sort of game that you want to play uh, on a, a mobile phone because it's got like, you know, your wins and losses happen so quickly that the the only moment of challenge you have in the game is when you jump. And that's your only point of success or failure. And it makes it very easy to say, like, you know, after you die, you just stop. Um, and that's exactly what you want out of something that you're playing on a smartphone on like a, you know, holding it with one hand while the other hand grips the rail of the streetcar because you're in transit. Um, and like, I'm well aware that you can have much more in-depth experiences on a phone. You can create much more complex control schemes and um, a lot of other things. But it's just, it's the shortest um, sort of possible session length you can conceive of. It's just like these really, really tiny experience games. But it's fitting, it's fitting the situation, right? Like they put Metal Gear Solid on the PSP, um, but who... If I'm standing in line at a grocery store, I don't. Mm. Wanna, I'm not going to whip up Metal Gear Solid and play that for a minute. Yeah, exactly. I'll, I'll play. I'd play Cliff, or I'd play Super Hexagon. I'd mm-hmm. play games that can be exhilarating for five seconds, ten seconds, and have that built into it. You know, uh, and having that death bounce back so you can try something else. Uncharted has always done that really, really well. Mm. There's no loading to mm-hmm. it. It just bam. It just re- rewinds time almost. Uh, Limbo was really, really fantastic for that as well, where you just. It wants you to die. It wants you to lose and then try again immediately. Whereas like games like Dark Souls, Bloodborne, Mm -hmm. you lose and it's a long trek and it's a loading screen. We think about what you did in a game that does take a lot of trial and error and it seems a little bit counterintuitive. Yeah, I mean, you have uh, even have a game like Braid where you just literally rewind time to before you died. It's yeah, it's like the game. It's the gamification of save scumming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that that's you know. Obviously, as, as much as I'm talking about like getting into an experience quickly, you can optimize the heck out of getting a player into a play session. But as you said, it still doesn't mean you're going to whip out Metal Gear Solid and start playing it just out and about. Um, just because a game can run on handheld hardware doesn't necessarily mean that players are going to play it on the go, right? Like you're you're you've got like um, you know, some very advanced like RPGs on your phone. You know, your phone is now like as powerful as like the, not the necessarily the current gen, but like the last gen consoles, just because they, everything that we're packing, uh, packing into our pockets is ridiculous. Um, but it's that power is good for other reasons. Um, and I'm, I'm not saying that we should try to only create um, games with tiny and short session lengths to be played on these mobile phones. We just have to consider that there are people who are only going to be looking for those kinds of experiences Um, just in the same way that there are people who are only going to be looking for longer experiences. You know, I have two games that I primarily play on my phone. I have Crossy Road and I have Hearthstone. I have Crossy Road as a way of wasting time. It is, it is my, I have a 30 second um, or like a a couple minutes of a bus ride ahead of me and I don't want to start um, writing the extended thoughts for the Gameology podcast or I don't want to go back to reading Game of Thrones. I just need, I literally just want something to waste my time, to waste the next couple seconds and that's why I pop open Crossy Road. Or if I'm walking to and from work, that's when I pop open Hearthstone because I've got like 10 or 15 minutes while I'm walking to play the game and And not bump into anything. Yeah, and it's one of those games where, because it's Mm turn-based, I mean, turn-based can be such a powerful thing, especially on the mobile front, where you can tap it and then look away. Yeah. And you can come down and that decision is just sitting there nice uh, nice and pleasantly waiting for you. What I I was pl- getting into Persona 4 Golden on the Vita and I would love if they had a version of any of these JRPGs, especially if you want to put Final Fantasy on a mobile phone, that's fine, but could you do it in a way that I could do it with one hand? Not virtual buttons, just tap somewhere and then that's where your character goes to because that makes a lot more sense to be able to do it with one hand. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's definitely like certain experiences that definitely lend themselves better to certain, um, you know, hardware. And we, we can talk more about that another time. Sure. But just, uh, you know, they're, they're, 
Keeping in mind how often people on the go are going to be looking for an experience where all they want is abnegation. They just want to waste time like I do with Crossy Road. But then there are also people who are going to use that very same device to play uh, longer form games like Hearthstone or even more complicated games ideally shouldn't really be on a phone. You know, if you're going to be playing something that's that much more complicated, you, you probably need some face buttons that aren't just like virtual joysticks or things represented on screen. Um, and, you know, I would uh, say that Okay, mobile is like the sort of minimum tier, super fast iteration time. Um, you know, you're you're looking at an experience which might last um, ten seconds or less. Like, y- if you can create an experience on a mobile phone that is all about like how quickly can a user get through a given set of challenges. Like, I think the like don't tap the white tile series was like that, um, where you know your play sessions last less than ten seconds because you are trying to make your time as close to zero as possible. Um, so that that kind of thing works really well. Then sort of the next tier up from that is your sort of like 3DS, Vita, PSP kind of level where you have, that, that's probably something you're going to play more on like a longer bus trip or a, a train or a plane or something where you're you're not quite in the comfort of your own home, but you have, you know, more buttons at your fingertips. You're you're settling in for a longer trip and you're you're looking for something that's a bit more of a media experience. Yeah, absolutely. And I noticed that with a lot of these video games that they are so obsessed with the power of it that these it takes forever to just get into the game. Mm. You have to watch a lot of splash screens. But you look at the evolution of it when uh, when the NES started getting uh, more popular and the different kinds of games they made because you were sitting at home. Whereas arcade games originally, like Space Invaders, Pac-Man, these yep. were just like stay alive games as long yeah. as you can. They were they were more like mobile games. You mm-hmm. put a quarter in and maybe you played for 30 seconds if you were terrible and longer if you were really skilled. Mm-hmm. Mario gave you a chance to go through levels, which you had never really done in an arcade before because you might spend a few hours with it. And then Zelda and a battery chip were like, what if people spent weeks with a game yeah. and on the same quest? And we've seen that length. And now, how about... Um, like long session games. Now, what are some games that you might sit and and is there is there a way that can make the that can make the experience improved by say playing a game for four hours at a time or longer? Well, I think we sort of cut back to the um you know the the trend that we I was mentioning with Nintendo games saying like hey take a break and people are like people hate being told by the game that they should take a break is like no this is my time I want to play the game right now so. You can have games that allow for these longer play sessions. I think that the best thing you can do is create the opportunity for people to break things up into smaller sessions. Um, You know, like you can have a fantastic long book that you can just read, you know, chapter by chapter. But the fact that it's broken up into those chapters means that at any point you can just sort of like hop out of the experience. And, you know, in the same way that if a game is broken up into levels or missions or quests or what have you, whatever the buzzword for that particular game is, you know, those completing a quest, um, completing a side quest, you know, well, the, these, there are different tasks that uh, in, in larger games and RPGs, you can like, I'm going to take on this like story quest, or I only have a little bit of time, I'm going to take on this little side quest. Um, and you, some, some games are great in offering players the ability to sort of like choose um what like like how much you want out of a play session um like when i created zarnok fortress i put two different load options in the game like literally choose how you want the game to load itself into memory either just one level at a time or hey are you going to be here a while okay let's load all the games into memory or all the levels in the game into memory so that you you don't have to wait between levels it just you know you have to wait about uh, a minute and a half at the very start of the experience but it's you know, I put that option in there, which I know most games probably can't do that. Most pre- most games probably would break the memory limit on whatever machine they're running on if they tried to load in everything into memory all at once. But uh, just it was it was a thing that I could do in Zarnok Fortress, so I gave people the option of choosing it. Um, and you know that that's all to just sort of accommodate shorter or longer play session lengths, because you know sometimes you do just want to like sit down and play a game for like a matter of hours and sometimes that means like marathoning through an entire game i know like when you're especially excited about like a triple a AAA, um high octane experience and let's say that the entire game might only be like six to eight hours um you might be so into the game and so into the gameplay that you're willing to just sit down and beat that in two separate play sessions um but you can't 
count on the fact that players are going to be doing that necessarily. You know, maybe some people are excited. Maybe some people are coming into this game um, years later after it's released and they're not as big of a fan of the franchise. They're not willing to like plonk down such a significant chunk of their life into just, you know, one sitting. I had a, an experience with The Last of Us where I was leaving the country. My friend wanted me to play this so bad. He's like, just come over and, and just play the intro. I want to show you the intro. And I liked mm-hmm. it so much. I said, well, I'm leaving tomorrow, but we can beat this today. And it it was, oh uh, it was yeah, it was really immersive, though, because I think I played all day and stayed up till five in the morning and he fell asleep. But that game is a survival slog and the characters are weary of the world and you're being attacked. And it's it's not a pleasant experience for them. And I felt like... For that instance, for that game, that that uh, that style of marathon playing, torturing myself, actually it was worked out appropriate. Yeah, it worked out pretty well. Well, that's going to do it for this episode on session length. Uh, this is the Gameology podcast. Of course, we cover lots of deep dives into different aspects of game design and games. In case this is the first episode you're listening to, you can reach me at GameThinkTalk on Twitter or GameThinkTalk at gmail.com with any questions, concerns, anything you might want to see on the show or have heard on the show. And how about you, Attila? You can find me on my website at bluishgreenproductions.com where you can find a nice handy little submit button for any questions or comments that you want to send our way and we might even answer a couple of them on the show you can also follow me on twitter at bluish green pro oh and i should mention that on my website every week i post my extended thoughts on the subjects that we discuss bye for now